We live in a time when our idea of community is frayed, strained due to our busy lives, challenged by the political landscape and competing responsibilities. Some of us believe that getting involved will not change anything, that being civically engaged will just lead to defeat and frustration. But what does it mean to feel empowered enough to take action on an issue of concern, to get involved in a cause bigger than ourselves? Fortunately, there are many people in our community who are doing something about the conditions in which we live. They are creative and dynamic individuals who are fighting for what is right and for better lives for everyone. This program will show you that one person can make a difference and that the power of one is within all of us. Welcome to the power of one. Michaela, thank you so much for being here today. This is great to have Thanks. you on. Thanks for having me. So, you know, um, your background is in public school research. And um, so you do a lot of analysis of public school districts and individual schools. Um, but then eventually you went into um, running a, a charter school. So how did that happen? I, what, what was the genesis of, of that process? Well, in, in our particular case, it was really a marriage of research and practice. We were studying uh, all the high school dropouts throughout different districts. So when you looked at, when you look at a chart of a, a high school and you, it's, it has a pyramid where the ninth graders start and then only a smaller percentage get to the 12th okay. grade. And so we were looking at districts that were huge percent dropouts, uh, 50% mm -hmm. in LA Unified. Um, and so I started to ask the question, how, um, how's our dropout rate doing in Pasadena Unified? Um, at the same time, I started asking, and you know, my energy was on it. Uh, they started to show up at our at our tutoring center, and so I was sort of. Oh, right, you developed it. a tutoring center previous or prior to. Yes, yeah. um, the Learning Works prior was a tutoring center that now is called Community Works for right. students in this, basically in normal schools. Um, but so I was researching dropout rates and then I was meeting them and my worlds were kind of coming together. And so at that point I asked, I figured out in the district, I asked what was the dropout rate. And at that point it was 24.6%, yeah. which was yeah, for our that. size really felt high to me and yeah. the affluence that we have in this district. Um, so it really just started me down a journey of how do we get dropouts back in school. Um, and as I tried to do that within the constraints of a school district, um, it really was an out-of-the-box problem. I would be going to doors, um, I remember at Pasadena High School, where I'd be returning a dropout and knocking on the teacher's door and say, I know this student hasn't been here since November, will you take them back? Uh, and how, would, what was the response? No, come back second semester. Um, so at that time, oh. I didn't. At that time, I was like, "What do you mean second semester? What's this kid gonna, you know?" Right for two more months. Yeah, but it eventually made sense to me that the a normal high school setting didn't know how to yeah. ha deal with a student that's been there the whole time doing all the content. And then, what do you mean? You just want me to give this kid a fresh start, and you know yeah. they get the same grading? So. We then worked with the school district to start what I call a dependent charter school. Um, at that point, Jack Luce and I were doing all kinds of alternative ed work together. He's great. He runs CIS in Rose City. In Rose City. Yeah. yeah. So he's, he's awesome. And Coco, his counterpart, um, mm. probably the best part of his team. <laughs> um, I won't tell him you said that. Yeah, he, he can hear that. <laughs> so then we started to try to work with even what I'd say a higher risk, someone who's been on a couch for five months, someone who has substance abuse, someone who is in homeless, probation, yeah. gang, teen parents. And even as we were developing our philosophy and how to do this, it was really outside the boundaries of a regular school district. Yeah. And then we ended up doing a charter school. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you a little bit about charter schools in a minute. But before we do that, <laughs> what are, let's talk more about what are the strategies you utilize to help a dropout get back on track? And to help, and then thinking about transformation because that's part of it. Because um, people's lives are so um, turned inside out, so to speak. Yeah. Um, what do you do to help kids transform their thinking about themselves and where they fit in society? Well, I think we first have to transform how adults see kids. So oh, the transformation well. comes with the adults. 
So uh. the, the trouble with schools is by the time they're either doing something wrong or not showing up, and I'm saying even at fifth grade or fourth grade, there's so much judgment. There's so much, you should have been here. Why didn't you understand this? You yeah. know, well, who cares if your mom didn't drop you off on time? So the, what really the first strategy in dealing with high risk populations is no judgment. It's welcome, glad you're here. Yeah. Um, and that is, that has been a very effective way of living for me um, and brings all kinds of wonderful people into my life. So we, um, we started practicing that. We started that idea of just, um, I don't even think it's forgiveness at that point because it's basically pro something probably went on in your young life that created a set of conditions that doesn't allow you to perform at the level that you know people would want or even you would want. And so we then started to create these set of principles about unconditional love and fresh start and non-judgment and these were not just strategies because they become they are a practice that you do but they're really a belief system that we mm -hmm. have about youth and young adults um, that it, it, it's not going to help them graduate if you're going to hold all these judgments and everything yeah. else you're going to get nowhere well and i know a lot of your beliefs or a lot of your um, strategies philosophies are grounded in your spirituality and so if we're in a society that is um, Christian and says, uh, we believe in forgiveness, we believe in mm -hmm. redemption, we believe in second chances, why is it so hard, it seems like, for our society to suspend that judgment? I think, speaking as a fellow Christian, that we're not really that good at that. <laughs> There's a lot of words and actions that don't always line up in the history of Christianity. So the, really, that's what it's about. It's, it's, it's how do we live out the words. Yeah. And when you live out the words, you are connecting with people as equals mm. in kinship, that you're recognizing that they're living their own set of conditions, I'm living my own set of conditions. Uh, it's more about mutuality than it really is about even forgiveness. I mean. Something mm -hmm. can go wrong in our school, yeah. and then we have to come to be accountable, and then we have to come to forgiveness, and then we have to come to fresh start. But as a human condition, I think we're all living with our own conditions. So, um, and, and, and schools just don't recognize that. There's just so much hierarchy in districts and schools, yeah. uh, everywhere. So much, um, I'll teach, you'll learn. Uh, it's just the way the system was designed yeah. in most places. One of the reasons why I'm pushing on the societal aspect is because I think schools are um, representations of the society around Agreed. them. Agreed, yeah. And so um, part of, I think, the, the nut to crack is this whole notion of, of um, seeing other people as valuable. Yes. And not demeaning or feeling as though there's any superiority on, on some people's part. I'm not saying the schools are doing that. I, I perceive that as more of a societal issue. But there are some folks who believe other people are throwaway or they Oh, absolutely. And so how do we, so since you're the, uh -huh. the researcher, how do we then start to get them to think a little bit differently about who, the people who they think are throwaway, which you and I know have tremendous value? Well, it's a lot easier. I've lived and learned this at this point, it's a lot easier to have compassion and tenderness for a different type of population when you know someone in that population, if you've been through it in your family. Mm -hmm. So if you look at issues of incarceration, if you n personally know someone who's been incarcerated, you've gone through the pain of that, you tend yeah. to have more of an open heart to it. Yeah, the separation, the visiting yes. of the family member. Mental illness, yeah. uh, autism, you name it. Um, if you've been exposed and you've lived it and you've felt it, then um, you can, uh, can actually come at it with more compassion and tenderness. But if you're living in like a place like Pasadena where there's a wide range of socioeconomic and what we'll call, which is very urban, segregated uh, neighborhoods, mm -hmm. then it's really quite possible that someone 
over on one side of town isn't going to see the mental illness on another side of town, or they're not going to understand the poverty on the other side of town. And so then there's this disconnect where we're all just sort of living in our own space. And if you only live in your own space, your own mind and your own heart, it's going to be very difficult to connect with a wide range of populations. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we get people to connect? So I have come over to Learning Works. We, what I think mm -hmm. it is, is you have to, uh, uh, there's a lot of fear. We can go with gang and violence. Yeah. Um, I think we have a hard time talking about, um, well, let's just start with race. With race, um, I have uh, a very African-American Latino school. Um, we, I, get to, I get the privilege as a white woman to talk with African-American males about their plight, <laughs> uh, mm. their discrimination. I get to experience it and see it, it and cry with it um, often. Um, Ha, it, but but I want to. I want to be in that kind of solidarity. Mm -hmm. So it really is a commitment to understanding other populations, but not understanding, being with. Right. Big difference. Not serving. We don't serve being with. Yeah. Um, and so whether that's, I know you've had other guests here, whether that's being with the homeless at the bad weather shelter, um, not serving them, being with them, near their cots and all that, yeah. or going to court with kids, that's really what does it and breaks down barriers. Yeah, I mean, there's a difference between compassion and empathy and, yeah. and forming a relationship yeah. where you actually um, not just understand, but you live with other people and you live um, in their conditions or um, understand their conditions more. You're connected more to them. So do you have um, mechanisms or systems by which um, you're helping some, some of those people in Pasadena to better understand um, the challenges that other families face? Well, so some of the things that we do, we have a concept called chasers in our school. Yeah. And it's interesting. So the chasers are a group of young adults that came from the same conditions of the kids. They now have some, half of them, I think, have graduated from Learning Works. Um, and they are the bridge for students to come back to teachers, basically, yeah. to re-engage. Because they're going to be more likely to trust, after they've been sort of not liked by the system, trust a chaser before they then connect with a teacher, mm -hmm. um, even in our environment. So I'm always intrigued, though, when new people come through to visit. We get visitors and tourists. In some ways, that's the first level of connection. They like the chasers. They like the connecting. Mm -hmm. Um, but the chasers are fairly cleaned up students, <laughs> meaning the chasers have, are going to college, they're helping people now, they're doing all these things that are just amazing. It, you get addicted to giving back once you start. Yeah. And so here are these examples of um, people from conditions that they've overcome. Um, whereas the students, they're still living a lot of those ugly mm. behaviors and things that people aren't very um, forgiving or compassionate about. So. The chasers help as my ambassadors, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and they're they're out in the community, and so yeah. they're interacting more and telling um, stories. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of stories, do you, would you mind sharing one of uh, one of your students who's um, transformed their life and um, and is now um, prospering, thriving. thriving? Well, we've graduated over seven hundred and fifty students. We do follow up studies on all of our. In kids. how many years? Um, over, this is our, we had eight graduating classes, so, okay. yeah. Yeah, about 100 a year. Yeah, and they're all first generation graduate um, type of people who, um, it's a really big deal that they made it to the stage, and I still believe, and the research says it, that that statistic matters in the long run in, um, you know, what happens in your life. Um, we have had people uh, go off and do solar paneling certification training and making $25, $27 an hour. We've um, had people, students who are now working in the healthcare industry um, we, mm. that are now, um, you know, doing phlebotomy and all this other, you know, ultrasound and you're, you know, it's just very, very exciting. Um, and in fact, a third of our kids are most interested in healthcare, which I think is very interesting. We're giving back. Yes, giving back. So I, I think what I'm most proud, though, about my students once they mm. come to the stage is that their time management has changed, they are focused forward, they're hopeful, 
Um, and so when you meet up with them again, like which we do, it's a small town, yeah. um, they're just, they're adults, they're directed, they're focused. Um, they are not incarcerated as much as people who don't make it to stage. So we're not seeing recidivism in that, uh, which yeah. is great. And they're not, even though I have teen parents, they're not having as many babies. So they're, they're, they're basically trying to make a life for themselves to get themselves out of the conditions of poverty. Yeah. So um, there are a lot of, you, you've been doing such great work for a considerable amount of time. Um, something that occurred to me uh, while I was preparing for the show was, is there any chance that you're working wor your way out of a job or is that um, a goal of yours? Is that? Gosh, I hope so. Um, so when I started Learning Works in Pasadena Unified, and there was great political support. It's been a good partnership with the district. I mean, we're a charter school that people like because we're taking expulsions in, probation. Um, so, so we're really a model of this sort of learning lab idea. Well, and you're taking kids that might not be accepted in other contexts. Yeah, and a lot of them are, they're, they're, they're not in school. So yeah. you're not taking attendance away from no. anyone. So, and then they tend to be on the older end, and we age out at 18 in most school districts, so here we are. Um, but what has happened here um, in Pasadena is that I do think, and I'm going through renewal next year, so we'll have lots of data and um, be talking a lot about mm -hmm. this, but I mean, the whole demographic here has shifted because of housing. Yeah. Um, uh, teen pregnancy has gone down, which I'm thrilled with. But there's a, a shifting that happens here. Some of the gang movement is more out east. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have our Pasadena site, and we also are the school at Homeboy Industries in Boyle Heights, mm -hmm. where I don't see the demographic shifts as much yet. Now we'll see with gentrification and what's coming. Mm -hmm. um, so I could always get myself out of a job if I limited myself to communi the community, but yeah. I'm concerned about the broader picture in LA. And um, so then you can't sleep. You're on L.A. Yeah. But again, it's what I was talking about before. It's societal. And, and then it's also thinking about the causes. So whether it's poverty or whether it's um, socioeconomics um, or whether it's um, racism and discrimination, um, there are huge issues. Drug abuse, huge. Yeah. Yeah, huge. addiction. Mental health, we just ignore it. Yeah. Yeah, so how do we... Um, there, you know, how do we then start to change some of those components of society, and in particular the, the socioeconomic one and um, bringing people out of poverty? If, so one thing, I, to be more specific, many times I've heard you say poverty sucks. Poverty sucks, who wants it? Yeah, and I've also heard you say that education is if not the best method or pathway mm -hmm. for bringing people out of poverty, it is, it is one of the most effective. Mm -hmm. So if those are tr both true statements, which I agree with, how do we then craft a society that emphasizes education for everyone and high quality and um, you know, deep follow through? You, since you're around the state doing your um, analysis and research and then um, the consulting that you do, um, are there places that are doing it better than um, we are in Southern California? Well, I think it's a, it's a little different everywhere you go. So the, the first big context answer is California is like the bottom on education funding. So we have, first yeah. of all, a California problem. We aren't prioritizing the education it takes for a very heterogeneous state. That's it. Secondly, in California, we have spent a lot of time on high school and college going and um, you know, getting to UC, but we have continued to decrease funding streams on vocational education, mm -hmm. technical education. And so in essence, we're, we, we, with our underfunding, have created high schools for those going to college when we know only 35% of the state graduates from college, meaning four-year degree. Right. So we're really setting ourselves up for not serving that you know, 65% that are not going to get the four-year degree. Um, so that's the big context. And then from there, we look at urban. And when we look at where we are draining um, economically and where we're not um, putting emphasis on this lower socioeconomic, 
these urban drains are huge, and that's where our dropout population is. That's where our under um, underemployed youth and young adult mm -hmm. populations are. So we'd have to start looking at that, I think, to become more um, of a vibrant post high school uh, place. Yeah, um, so from what I understand, what you just said, uh, funding on a statewide level and then uh, an emphasis not just on the kids who are going to college, but um, development of career pathways in vocational um, areas for kids who, or young people who are not gonna go on to college, is that right? Yes. Um, so then one of the questions, or subsequent questions is, how do you get the state to um, reallocate funding so that um, we're at a higher level? Like, I think Massachusetts is yeah. funding at a very high level. What, what needs to happen? Well, we've to... got the property tax problem. So, I mean, uh, basically, we, that's our problem, is we don't want to give up um, on, we don't want to give money to the state to do education. I mean, other states' property taxes are a huge mm. portion of education funding. Um, so we've got that issue. We've got the huge charter school, um, I, I don't want to call it, it's a, partially a drain yeah. on the districts that don't know, they don't know how to right size. So you, you don't know how to decrease when you're union and all that to then mm -hmm. uh, so be able to support that funding stream decreasing. So we've got to be able to talk about that at some point too as a, as a state, because in, especially in urban areas. Yeah, and just to clarify, uh, what you said earlier is that charter schools, their intent is to be uh, exploratory, to be laboratories, to be able then to take best practices back to um, school districts and so they can utilize them. And I believe that um, LearningWorks is one of those. Um, how, how has the charter movement then evolved into like pseudo private schools within the context of a public school district? Well, I, I mean, the, there's a few different ways it's described and the movement has changed since, in many ways since the beginning. So an example, the, the beginning vision for charter schools were these mom and pop little, you know, schools. Well, now you have charter management organizations that have multiple schools, Companies, economy yeah. of scale within those. So then you, in essence, have a big district that's mm -hmm. you know across district lines when you have those. So so there's a few things that didn't that ch that changed, and there's a couple reasons that happened. One is um, a lot of innovative leaders jumped out of the regular public schools. They say it's the the brain drain. So a lot of innovative educators left um, mm. regular districts to start to be starters, to be entrepreneurs. And then on top of that, once you're, it's not an easy business to start. I mean, schools are hard to run. They're very complicated. So then there's this once you get it, how do I keep it going on economies of scale? We know this about regular school districts. Smaller mm. districts suffer, bigger have more to play with. So it's, it's very complicated. My frustration with the movement, there are good charter schools, there are not good charter schools. There are good traditional public schools, there are not good tra traditional. But we can't seem to talk across lines because they, mm. the, the positions are at odds. The charters are seen as just taking ADA and charters are, um, see them as maybe they'll do a better job than the public school in your local area. So it's, it's a very hard policy bridge to, um, to get over and we haven't, we haven't been able to do it yet. Yeah, I wonder if that takes some sort of diplomacy on the part of either elected officials, leaders within mm -hmm. school districts, someone to sort of you know, hand the olive branch out there and uh, get people to listen to one another. Well, and it's all also about campaigns. I mean, either if you're a union or you're a charter association, you're throwing money into these campaigns. So then it just is still more of the divide. Yeah. So I wish we had a lot more time to, to talk a little bit more about solutions. Um, but kind of to wrap up today, um, what are you most proud of as far as your last eight years? What are, what, when, when you think about it late at night um, before you go to bed, what do you, what do you kind of give yourself a pat on the back about? I think that I'm most proud by my own transformation. I'm most proud of what I opened myself up to be given. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that took risk, that took some really bad days. <laughs> um, but it was opening myself up to people and being uncomfortable mm -hmm. and learning from that. And that then resulted in amazing staff, amazing chasers, amazing students, great partnerships, great connections. That That's probably, if I hadn't had that spiritual sort of calling it and, and chased it, <laughs> then it wouldn't have happened. Um, I really feel great about how many graduates we've had. I think we're affecting right. community um, health. I used to think we were affecting students or families or what have you. I think mm -hmm. what we'll see in the next census is that the community has changed because of the efforts of the staff at Learning Well, Works. and so many of them are parents themselves. And so when Absolutely. you see them dealing with their yeah. kids and That's then what we're caring, for. loving, mm -hmm. supportive, yeah. it's, it's incredible. Um, how do you take care of yourself? I, I have a, a new routine. I swim. I just, no matter when the day gets bad, I just say keep swimming. But I'm a big prayerful person. I go to church at First United Methodist. I, you know, love to, I meditate, I swim. But is it difficult in the middle of all the crisis? Yes, it's, it's become something I focused on more later. Well, well, but also you have so many responsibilities of staff, students, fam, you know, the families, yeah. um, you know, budget, yeah. um, audits. You know, there's a considerable amount that you're working on. Well, I think the goal is to just tell the mind to stop and live in the moment, live in the presence of whatever you're dealing with right then and there. Mm -hmm. That's the trick. Yeah. Um, so I want to thank you publicly for all the work you've done oh, in this community thanks. because it's it's extraordinary. It's exceptional. Unfortunately, as we talked about earlier, some people feel as though there are. Um, you know, once a criminal, always a criminal. Once a dropout, always a dropout, a loser. And you've given them a second chance. You've given them the opportunity that they wouldn't have had otherwise. So you've provided. They're beautiful people. And that's that's. That's what we need but to that's, be able to see. I know that's the most frustrating <laughs> How part. How we're all losers and we're all winners? <laughs> yeah. We're beautiful people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much for Thanks. being here today, and um, uh, best of luck to you in your next. Um, school year. Thanks, Brian.